we can go ahead now. <laughs> so good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to tonight's uh, talk. Uh, our speaker tonight is Mr. Sanjay Jha, whom you surely would have seen before on your television screens as he was the official spokesperson of the Congress from 2013 until very recently. He's also the president of All India Professionals Congress in Maharashtra and the executive director of the Dale Carnegie Training Operations in India. He worked closely with the Gandhis during his years with the Congress. He coached Sonia Gandhi when she staged her political debut in the 1990s, advised her in government and in opposition, but grew increasingly frustrated as the party became progressively rudderless over the past decade under Rahul Gandhi. In his new book, which he will be discussing tonight, The Great Unraveling, India After 2014, he takes a long, hard look at several contemporary and important political questions. What are the reasons for the Congress's acute lack of oppositional ability? Is a resurrection of this seemingly somnolent giant even possible? What would it entail? Can the party look beyond the easy fallback of the Gandhi family charisma and embrace transformational change? Can it sell its vision of inclusive growth and social justice? Asked recently on Twitter whether he planned to join the BJP, he wrote, and I quote, I would not be questioning the PM and giving ideas to the Congress. The Congress historically has had many a Judas and several turn turncoats, but I'm just a boring, but in a Arabian sort of guy. I'm stubbornly loyal, but only to the Congress ideology. I'll now hand over to Mr. Jha. You can type your questions in the chat box uh, when he speaks. I'll read out some of your questions to him during uh, the question answer session that will follow his time. So over to you, Mr. Jha. Uh, firstly, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mukherjee, and to all the members of a uh, very esteemed August uh, Bengal Club for having invited me today. Uh, I just want to let you know that uh, it's always a privilege uh, for anyone, not just because I'm an author trying to promote my book, but I think for everyone to be able to engage with a very enlightened uh, audience. Uh, you know, I've come to Kolkata quite often, uh, having, uh, you know, been a Bihari. I was born uh, in, in Bhagalpur in Bihar. And, uh, you know, I always remember that Calcutta, as it was called that time, was a one big city in close proximity to my state. Uh, so coming there to watch an India versus England test match at the Eden Gardens uh, or, you know, generally to just come and meet my uncle, uh, you know, for me, Calcutta was always a, a city that I have felt is just more than just a city of joy. It has so much to offer. And later on, when I did my MBA from XLRI Jamshedpur, uh, once again, we used to come down to Kolkata to have our tournaments against I am Kolkata. So it's great to be here. And uh, I want to thank you once again for being here with me this evening at seven o'clock. Uh, you know, Mr. Mukherjee told me that uh, we normally give our speakers around 30 to 40 minutes to speak. And then we have a Q and A for 15, 20 minutes. I want to reverse that. I believe uh, there is a fantastic logic as to why TED talk has 18 minutes because it is normally uh, assessed that the attention span diminishes significantly after 18 minutes. And I would love to grab as much of your mind as much as the time permits. So I'm going to speak for just about 20 maximum, and I'm going to time myself, and I'm going to leave you with at least 25, 30 minutes to ask me your questions. And I'm very excited to have a more interactive dialogue with you. Let me jump straight into the issue. Uh, the book, uh, in case you haven't seen it, is The Great Unraveling. This is what the book looks like. Uh, uh, the Great Unraveling India After 2014. Uh, there are two points that the title is very clear on. The manifestations are that I have looked at India after the victory, a landslide victory of the BJP under Mr. Narendra Modi in 2014, beginning May 16th, and which has continued after the 2019 Lok Sabha results. I've also been very clear at the very beginning in the title itself uh, that India is unraveling. And the reason why I say that India is unraveling, and I, you'll be a little distracted by my Pablo out there at the back. Uh, the reason why I say India is unraveling is because I do believe 
something is fundamentally broken in our country. We hear a lot about GDP, FDI, ease of doing business. You know, these are the normal buzzwords in the pink papers. Everyone is talking about a booming stock market. Uh, we talk about infrastructure spending. But as a society, we need to think a little deep and ask ourselves a question. Do we live in an economy or do we first live in a society? And a society is not just about the economy. It is about less marital rape. It is about gender parity. It is not about communal temperature rising because of anti-love jihad laws. It certainly isn't about targeting Dalits and the scheduled tribe because they are more underprivileged and easier to attack. It certainly isn't about worsening poverty at the cost of giving financial resources in the hands of a few. There is, whether we like it or not, first and foremost, that we live among each other. And I do believe that these are fundamental seminal issues that have today become a reality of our lives. We can't pretend that they don't exist. My book attempts to address them. I speak to you here less as a former Congress spokesperson or a you know, politician you know, with great personal ambitions that a lot of people associate all of us to be possessing. I speak to you as an ordinary citizen of this country. That when we heard over the last four or five years that several Muslims, a few from other non-Muslim uh, religions as well, were being lynched to death by savage mobs. How could any one of us go to sleep in the night thinking it's all fine? Whether it happened in Jharkhand or Rajasthan or West Bengal, Assam, that, that's not the consequential issue. The issue is that I remember reading about lynching way back when I was reading about the civil rights movement in the United States, when the Ku Klux Klan was hanging African-Americans from the, from the trees. And I was thinking, this is the modern civilization, the great country of Mahatma Gandhi, Pandit Nehru, Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose, Rabindranath Tagore, eminent intellectuals, freedom fighters. And this is the country which seems to be giving license to violence and not really having any serious moral compunctions to stand and fight against it. Let me make a political statement at the very beginning. It is not as if these things did not happen, perhaps sporadically, earlier. I agree that the CBI was indeed a caged parrot. It sure was. Were there not pressures in other investigating bodies like the Income Tax Enforcement Directorate? Probably yes. Many people will say that you know, the Supreme Court uh, saw out of turn promotions when Mrs. Gandhi was the prime minister during the time of the emergency or pre-emergency. The answer to that is yes. Was there violence that happened that killed over 2,500 Sikh brothers of ours during the 19, 1984 Sikh riots? I think that's a reality. We can't walk away and pretend that they did not exist. Yes, India has been battling many an internal demon. Things were indeed never optimal or never as they were emphasized once upon a time when Pandit Jawala Nehru in his famous speech on 15th August 1947 talked about India's tryst with destiny. I'm sure when Mahatma Gandhi got shot by Nathuram Godse, 
these were not the last few thoughts he had about India. Now let's fast forward to where we are. And today, it is by a great coincidence, honestly, that I'm addressing an audience which is based in Kolkata because you, ladies and gentlemen, are probably going to witness a very fascinating contest when the assembly elections happen in West Bengal. I don't think it's the future of the state which indeed is at stake. I think in a great number of ways. It doesn't matter where your political preference lies, but in a great number of ways, it is also a defining moment for which way India will move going forward. I believe the elections in Bengal, for which one can see that the campaigning has already been at a great uh, passionate level of intensity, is going to be intense, maybe highly uh, vitriolic, inflammatory, and I dare say could be violent. What we saw in the past hasn't inspired so much of confidence. So I, I can sense already at the very beginning that India is now in the throes of something which is perceptible in some senses and not visible in the others. But something is changing. And I have in my book, try to tell you the entire change in India in the form of a story. This starts with me giving, after my MBA at XLRI Jamshedpur, I'm asked a question in a final interview by the ANZ Grindley's Bank Management, that if I were given a choice to invite anybody home for dinner, living or dead, who would I choose? Trust me, ladies and gentlemen, I had not prepared for this question. When it came to me, frankly, without even a blink, I said Mahatma Gandhi. And I'll be honest with you, today, December 26th, Boxing Day, India has had a good day in, in Melbourne. I do feel that the country that I once lived in appears somewhat different. I'm today a lot more conscious, as are my children, as are many people I know, of my religion, of my caste, of my identity, of where I stand, and where I should possibly be looking at things. And I think in a, in a great number of ways, this is changing lives. You heard recently that in your own state, there's been a divorce because of a political factor. I write in my book about my whole XLRI WhatsApp group, which is split wide open and old friends who have known each other for 30 years are at each other's throats. Is Indian society fractured? Are we now already experiencing fissures and divides? for whatever, whatever reason, that is so polarizing that we find it hard to have conversations. Mr. Modi's government has probably done some things right. But in not having dialogue with enough stakeholders, has Indian democracy itself become fragile? There are farmers protesting and they are doing so at temperatures of three and four degrees centigrade. I'm in Pune right now, not in Mumbai, it's cold, but it's not three or four degrees. I wouldn't like to be outside at that hour of the night. It's not that the farm laws are bad, by the way, I have supported the farm laws. I believe the farm laws are good. In the long run, they will be good for the farming community. But, that is no substitute for political arrogance or for the belief that I don't have to talk to anybody because I got a majority in parliament or that I can run an Aadhaar bill as a money bill because I don't want to have a dialogue in the Rasabha. That we can attack journalists and file an FIR against them if they write or say something against us. 
And if somebody criticizes the government or Mr. Modi, should you board the next train to Pakistan? I think these are questions that we need to debate. <clears throat> we need to ask ourselves that this great diversity of India, this unity and diversity that I read when I was in school about India's unity and diversity, this was in my civics textbook. Is it still a reality? Or are we now targeting certain people by what they wear? Can you and I pretend anymore that we are not aware at any point of time about the identity of the person that we talk to? The state of Bengal, to the best of my knowledge, has been an epitome of syncretism, of oneness, of a beautiful secular character. All political parties, let me be very honest with you. If today there is simmering tension underneath, if the BJP today is probably adding fuel to fire, it does not mean that one party is solely responsible for destroying this earlier social tapestry. I'm sure all political parties play their own games for their own vote bank politics. But you and I, ladies and gentlemen, are members of civil society. And our job is to see through the games that politicians play and to do what is right. Because in my opinion, each and everyone who's here today with me in the evening is an opinion maker, is an influencer, is not just an one single voter. And I do feel that you have enormous powers within you to create a dialogue which is for the good of our society. I write in my book that a democracy is under threat, ladies and gentlemen. If people only take active part in it once every five years on a holiday to go and vote and then proudly show their finger with a little black mark on Twitter or Facebook and say, I discharged my obligations as a citizen of India. I think India needs a robust civil society. If you have to be a great democracy, they be deserve to be. I believe that when institutions of a country become suspect in the eyes of the common man, then you and I are in serious trouble. The question that you need to ask yourself, I do that to myself very often, is do we trust in our public institutions? What are they? Do you believe in your police? Do you find the media credible? Do you believe social media has no fake news? Do you trust the manifestos of your political party? Are you convinced that the income tax and the enforcement directorate are not vindictive and used by the state to target opponents? Are you convinced that the NIA discharges his job without bringing in any pressures from the central government, whichever party may be in power? Do you believe the CBI is impartial? Do you think election commission does its job the way it ought to be dispassionately? And perhaps most importantly, most importantly, do you trust your judiciary? If the answer to these questions do not range at nine to 10. The ladies and gentlemen, what you know is that our democracy is fragile, frail, and frangible. And I do believe, bottom line, that it's gonna be a long, long way before we get to sleep. I mentioned in the book about the media and my friend Arnav Goswami, with whom I spent considerable time in the Times Now studios. And trust me, I actually believe that he was fighting for the common man. When he questioned the government I was fighting for, Dr. Manmohan Singh's government, and he questioned us on everything from coal to 2G or whatever, I really thought he was fighting an anti-establishment crusade. 
it's sad that he thereafter became roughly another version of Fox News. I want to tell you all, ladies and gentlemen, that many politicians write books when they are at the December of their career. I have chosen to be in politics, it's my own choice. But I've written this book when I believe I'm still, by the yardsticks of Indian demography, fairly young for Indian politics, as in at least I'm, I'm pretty much active in, in the game, as they call it. So I've taken a risk. I have challenged the party I represent, the Congress party. The same Congress party that suspended me because I raised some very uncomfortable questions where I even posed some challenges to the leader, Mr. Rahul Gandhi. I got suspended. I am very fond of Rahul. Rahul the other day was criticizing Mr. Modi saying that India doesn't have a democracy. Sadly, the great party of Nehru and Gandhi, and probably a truly secular inclusive party, doesn't practice inner democracy on its own. So today, many of the leaders in the Congress party are hesitant to speak the truth, lest they be misunderstood by the high command. I took the risk because I realized India is much bigger and more beautiful than the sum of all its political leaders put together. India is not just about Mr. Modi and Rahul Gandhi and Mamata Banerjee and Akhilesh Yadav and uh, Mr. Stalin or Mr. Sharad Pawar. This is a great country. This is a country I'm terribly bullish on. This is a country I'm very optimistic about, no matter how much I have sounded despondent and dismayed with this current state of affairs. I want to let you know that I think until and unless we are able to challenge anyone in authority, Whenever we feel we are being shortcharged, India will never change. We need to recognize this one brutal truth that we are a country with people at, from all walks of life. I mean, please remember that even as we talk about big corporates, large industry, foreign direct investment, there are 22%, which is around 300 million people of India who are living below the poverty line, less than $2 a day. I believe the time to ask questions is now. I do feel that the Congress party is an, you know, I got a call from a friend of mine who told me, and I've written this in the book, that the idea of India is dying. And Sanjay Jha, I hold you equally responsible. Don't just blame the BJP and the RSS. I blamed you equally because you have been a silent, non-combative conspirator because I don't see the Congress party stepping up to fight to save this country. And it bothered me, it hurt me tremendously. And I write that with all honesty in the book. And I haven't, by the way, I don't mind if the Congress party expels me after the book is out. I have gone public and said, I think Mr. Rahul Gandhi should take a back seat. And the Congress party should have a non-Gandhi dynasty leader. No more dynasty. Not because Rahul isn't a good man or Priyanka Gandhi Vadra is not talented or Mrs. Gandhi hasn't done a wonderful job. But the Congress party, other talent must get a role. And just because somebody is not the president doesn't mean they don't have a political value to contribute. So I believe this is a time for change. And my book, however, ends with hope. And you know where my hope comes from, ladies and gentlemen? It comes because of you. Because every time I meet people in civil society, I hear their heartbeat. I, in their voices, I see sometimes elation, sometimes they are happy, but I also sense a deep knowing worry. And I go back to the one thing that stays with me even when I was a young kid. I grew up, this is my, my, my last line before I open this whole thing to you. I grew up a family of four. And typically, you know, at that point of time, three of us were born very close to each other, roughly one year, two year age gap. And my father was, you know, busy man. My, my mother had too much to handle. And so I was given, you know, in charge that my guardian was somebody who was to come to the house, a house help who stayed with us. And he was told to look after me. He had a name and his name was Nurul Hassan, a Muslim man. 
I grew up never understanding what it meant. What was this mazhab ki siyasat or dharmik rajaniti? Ye mere samaj mein kabhi nahi aaya. I grew up genuinely believing that India may have its simmering problems. It, it's understandable. All societies have them. Even, even in America, the Black Lives Matter continue. George Floyd gets killed. It's not going to be over in a hurry. But I never thought that a state and a government would encourage any degree of religious strife. I do believe the beauty of this country can only be destroyed if we remain quiet. It does not matter whether it's the BJP or the Congress, ladies and gentlemen. Please remember, silence is going to be a betrayal. Let's not be silent. Let's speak up. 2021, in my opinion, is going to be a significant year because the pandemic will be behind us. All of us will be safer, healthier. The vaccine will arrive. And very soon, ladies and gentlemen, there will be elections in Assam, in West Bengal, Tamil Nadu, Kerala, and Puducherry. But you know, humanity has one vulnerability. When we are in crisis, we pray to God. But when things go past us, we move on as if nothing happened. I do believe what the pandemic has taught us is how vulnerable we are. But it has also taught us why we should be one and we should collectively stand together. When Mr. Modi said, come to the balcony and you know, play this, you know, beat the vessels, I did that too. Not because of any other reason, because he was the prime minister. I opposed his politics and ideology. But I do believe that my leader was trying to galvanize the people of India into feeling positive. Let's remember this, ladies and gentlemen. Whatever our faults, you and I don't have the luxury of being silent. Let's not forget what we have gone through. But let's also remember that if we are one, whether Hindu, Muslim, Sikh, Christian, Jain, it doesn't matter. If we can remain a great country which fights as one, as a cricket team, as a hockey team, as a national security guard in the army, then we have no business whatsoever to allow the politicians of our country to divide us. I believe the great unraveling is therefore a statement of hope because I believe you can be the harbinger of that change. Thank you very much. And uh, Mr. Mukherjee, I'm open to all the questions. Thank you very much. Right. Uh let me read out uh, some of the questions that have already been sure. put. Uh, the first two are uh, sort of uh, similar. Uh, Shunitesh Mukherjee, what, according to you, will it take for the Congress to reclaim back the lost ground? And the second question, Bashov Rai Chaudhary. I believe uh, many understand and agree with your thoughts. However, many feel helpless against a very efficient election winning machine. What would it take for the main political opponent of the incumbent government to understand this and make way for the best people to lead it? Well, to answer the first question, I think um, the Congress is concerned. Uh, the reality is that it needs uh, a, definitely a leadership that is hungry to make a comeback. I think the problem that we have had is that we haven't shown alacrity, agility, speed to bounce back. I mean, West Bengal, when was the Congress there last time? And many people tell in the Congress that TMC is just a Congress offshoot. But the Congress per se has been obsolescent. We haven't been there in Tamil Nadu for over 50 years, in Odisha for 20 years, in UP for over 30 years, in Bihar for over 30 years, in Gujarat for 25 years, in Madhya Pradesh and Chhattisgarh around for 15 years. So I think the worry for the Congress is that you need a very dynamic, hungry leader who galvanizes the organization motivates the cadres and is able to give it direction. You know, until and unless you have somebody who's a you know, savvy, good communicator, the Congress cannot bounce back. And Rahul is a good man, well-intentioned, but I believe the Congress needs to now make a change and move forward. It, it's a great movement, it's a great party, but I think it needs a leadership change if I can pinpoint one big change it needs to make. It needs to own its ideology with passion. You know, the question on the BJP, BJP, let's, let's, let me tell you, I've told this to all my colleagues in the Congress. The BJP is a brilliant oiled machine for election victories. But the BJP is not stopping somebody else from becoming one too. So I believe, for example, the way they 
you know, they, they are blatant in many ways. I mean, fake news becomes official political strategy. That is wrong. I don't think I recommend the DMC or the Congress or any other party to employ that strategy. I do believe that one of the things that people can do, you, you know, BJP has all the money, electoral bonds money, they have a media capture. They, most of the mainstream media supports them because they advertise there aggressively. And they have, you know, as I say, a relentless uh, ability to kind of go on and on and on and bombard you and psychologically brainwash you. But I believe the way to beat the BJP is for direct public contact. I think the moment parties do more door to door, they do more nukkar meetings, parties are able to address the fake news and you are able to keep the discussion away from what the BJP wants the electorate to talk, which is this whole you know, communal maelstrom. I think, you know, Mr. Mukherjee, to answer those two questions, political parties need to establish rapport with the voter I find many parties that just give up because they think, you know, the BJP will polarize and win. I don't think so. I think India is at core a secular country. We allow that to change because we don't fight hard enough to save it. Right. Uh, this is uh, another question and uh, probably more fundamental. It says, if something is fundamentally broken, uh, Mr. Pradeep Kakkar, as you said at the outset, how do we fix it? Uh, your suggestions of more debate in civil society don't sound very convincing as solutions. What's the fundamental fix to our fundamental uh, breakdown? I mean, you've responded to part of this. But... Yeah, yeah, no, Mr. Bukhuji, I'm glad you said that. I think I do believe that ultimately, as I say, the power is not with the party in permanence. There are no permanent winners or losers in politics. Donald Trump believed that he was rightfully uh, you know, a victor of the 2019 elections in the US presidential elections. The same America, it's been polarized, I'm not going to deny it, has rejected the man. And it goes to tell you that end of day, while the opposition has a role to play, I think the most important thing that we need is to question governments. Now, you know, the fourth estate has become weak. The government has an institutional capture. The political party uses social media to spread fake news. I believe somebody heading West Bengal is from the BJP IT cell, very notorious for spreading fake news. Now you have to find a mechanism to counterattack that, right? And the only way that can be done is by a very vigorous interaction between politicians who are on the opposing part and the civil society. I believe opposition parties have let down India and civil society in a great number of ways has chosen to be much more quieter than we expected. I, for a long time until the CEA protests happened, I'll be honest with you, Mr. Mukherjee, I thought India had forgotten its protests. India had forgotten the right to protest. And if I look at Bengal, the history of Indian nationalism is, is frankly a Bengal story where no one took anything lying down. And I do hope, therefore I said it at the very beginning, the Bengal election is probably going to be an exhibition or where the future trajectory of India is going to be headed. Great. Uh, another question, another two questions which are on the same line, so shall we club them together. What, according to you, is the idea of India in 2020 versus what it was in 1947? And another one by Shubhrajit Mukherjee on the same lines, but making it more contemporary. Our founding fathers had imagined India in a certain way. It's clear that Modi Shah is trying to reimagine India according to the Sung ideological lines. Do you see any counterpoint to Modi Shah coming forward with a counter idea? Can the farmer protests became a, become a na nationwide movement? Can that be a starting point? Well, I think the farmer protests are just uh, an exhibition of the fact that the might of the common man cannot be stopped. Uh, let's not forget that the entire Arab Spring happened because one vegetable vendor had a rough day. And I think we should remember that these things can really escalate. But, you know, I do believe that bottom line, uh, what has changed is that you got a new idea of India, not the idea of India that was there in 1947, an inclusive, tolerant, progressive, secular, liberal, all encompassing of India. That was the dream. And we have maintained it for a considerable time. Don't forget, there were many historians who were so cynical of India that they believed this country would be dismembered. It would 
collapse of his own internal contradictions. Churchill believed he were nothing. Churchill, in fact, mocked India as nothing but a geographical expression. So I do believe the new idea of India that you're seeing, that you keep hearing new India from the BJP, is that, hey, listen, you know, can we get a little aggressive? Can we begin to look at you know, our religious credentials? Can we begin to now make demarcations on caste? Can we, which has been there, but they want to aggravate that even further. Can we now begin to look at the fact that there is a majority and a minority sentiment in the country? At bottom line, everything will be dictated by some supernatural power. I do believe that that is a tragedy. Now, you know, somebody asked, how do we stop that? You know, the only way to stop that, once again, is the fact that, you know, there are choices before us. We need to stand up when we disagree with something that is going wrong. You know, the problem is that very often we protest and we fight when something comes very close to a door. You know, that famous saying that first they came for, you know, X, they came for Y, they came for Z. And by the time they came for me, there was no one left to fight for me. And that's so true. So, you know, I think look at the interest of everyone that you're not related to. That's not your family, but it's perhaps living 50 kilometers away, maybe even 2,000 kilometers away in another state, but is getting marginalized and getting a road in. Fight for that today in a social media post, in a small discussion. Please remember, don't wait for big gatherings. Even five people talking together is change. Great. Uh, this is a question in a slightly different direction from Mr. Amit Avoshen, uh, has the left of center liberal group understood what their shortcomings were, which has been capitalized, capitalized on by the right, not only in India, but across the world? What, according to you, has caused this resurgence of the right nationalist forces? Somewhere, the right has filled up a lot of shortcomings. I think so. I, I think uh, a lot of the left liberal, I would say, population in different parts of the world significant, I, I thought once upon a time that would be the majority population, uh, was branded as elitist. That, you know, these were educated people, they were privileged, they had good education, uh, they had more, more access to establishment. And therefore, I mean, they were, they were arrogant. I mean, they, they created these abstract ideas like idea of India, uh, because for them, these were uh, wonderful thoughts, very Western imports. And I think everywhere post the globalization, when I think certain sections fell behind in that income uh, growth story, you had, you had nationalist leaders who came up and said, you know, you know what, this has happened because these guys concentrated resources in their hands. Take the example of the Congress, for example. Today we say suit boot ki sarkar, but this is a fact that crony capitalism happened during the time of the Congress. It started during our time. And therefore, when Mr. Modi came in, Mr. Modi went and said that we are corrupt and that we are elite and that we are the, we are the so-called Latians cabal. The fact is that Mr. Modi is getting electoral bonds money from the largest corporates, that he's, uh, he's giving some of the biggest natural assets and airports to some very, very favorite uh, corporate friends of his, right? Can you imagine Donald Trump, a man who doesn't pay his taxes, who owns casinos and five-star hotels and golf courses, was seen by the Rust Belt in America as the savior of the, of the poor. So these are ridiculous situations, but they happened because we allowed that drift to happen. I think the liberals did not fight hard. The liberals were lazy. If, I want to, if you want me to be blunt, I will tell you, the liberals were lazy. We were pontificating, we were doing intellectual you know, simulations, but we had disconnected from the common man and their problems. Here's a very provocative question Mahatma Gandhi, uh, from Mr. Ayan Chaudhary. Mahatma Gandhi felt that after independence, the Congress party had outlived its use and that it should be disbanded. <laughs> well, you, you, you know, Gandhiji was an absolutely, in my opinion, a clairvoyant genius. He was worried about one thing about the Congress. Because the Congress, if you remember, had, you know, Shama Prasad Mukherjee, Pandit Nehru had him in the, in the cabinet. Members of the Hindu Mahasabha were once part of Congress. So the Congress was very well crystallized, a true representation of a diverse India. He was worried that once competing political interests come in, the Congress may not be able to kind of probably, uh, you know, make the collective unit function in the way it should have. And he believed that we had outlived our role as a freedom struggle entity, and we should now allow for a new political formation to take place. I do think that that advice was basically a warning to the Congress that you better stick to the principles on which we fought the freedom struggle 
don't allow your parochialism to come in. He knew that many people in the Congress were also sympathizers of this larger majoritarian thinking. I can tell you even today, there are many people in my party who, who are secular perhaps, but are not averse to uh, you know, doing a truck or doing a deal with the RSS. That's also a fact of life. Uh, so I do believe there's nothing wrong. We can have a dialogue with anybody, but I think end of day, he was worried that the Congress will become a corrupt political outfit. Uh, sadly, many years later, he was proven right. So you've answered part of his question already, but let me ask the more provocative part. He says, he asks, uh, do you think that his foresight has been ignored for decades and that Congress has been kept artificially alive by keeping a Gandhi Nehru at the helm? <laughs> well, you know what? I mean, I think for to a large extent, it was a real politic. The Gandhis have had tremendous political capital. Uh, the Congress has been winning. But it's changed since 2014. We have been routed into Lok Sabha elections, Mr. Mukherjee. And I think it is basically a message to the Congress that we need to see meritocracy, we need to see talent, and that the dynasty story is being rejected by a modern India that is against any entitlement. And I think Rahul is going to face the brunt of it. It's not Rahul's fault, but he's got to take the brunt of it. And therefore, if Rahul is smart, he should make way for a non-Gandhi leader, be part of a winning team, uh, as opposed to being a captain of a team that is not going to do well. Right. Uh, two more questions along the same line. So let me read them together to you from Smita. You say time to ask the question is now, according to you, would apt education of the masses play a role in developing the spirit of inquiry and defining the best of democracy in our country? If so, how can it be developed all of a sudden? And another question from Dr. Julie Mehta, uh, not exactly the same, but probably similar. One of the niggling problems of the present political morass in India seems to be the lack of youthful blood. As you so pointedly say, we need a change. So how do you think we might initiate a new ethos of young, of young people to join politics and make a change? Well, you know, I do believe that education helps undoubtedly because education helps you make choices. Uh, you know, a lot of people were appalled, for example, in the US where my brother lives and my, my, my daughters travel to very often, that despite having so many cases of being a sexual predator, Donald Trump got majority of the women votes in, in the 2016 election. How do you explain that, right? And America is definitely a more enlightened society than ours if you look at basic education. What does it tell you? That ultimately it's not just about education, it's about how, you know, what are, what are our sensibilities? Uh, what are our feelings? What are emotions? And how empathetic we are as a society? And these are things that then don't have anything to do with education. I believe, you know, when you look at, look at Bengal today or Bihar today, both our states have a lot of backwardness. We don't attract too much of capital and industry. Many people are in agriculture and farming. And I do believe that, however, people are very, very politically conscious and aware. You know, Bihar and West Bengal have not seen riots like has happened in many, many other states. We have not seen the kind of communal strife that is engineered by political parties taking off and succeeding. They may have been trouble, but it hasn't got out of hand because somewhere people believe in fundamental values. And I do believe one of the positives that has emerged of late is a greater understanding that you need to know what is going on in your society. I think there's a greater consciousness coming in. Uh, probably fake news is hurting, but Today, I find a lot of younger people who are clued into what's going on. They, they are talking. They are being brainwashed by fake news. They are being distorted by boffed videos. That is also true. But there is a certain, at the subconscious level, I think India is becoming more a political country. I do believe that there is a dialogue that is happening on politics wherever I go. And it's a good sign. I'll give you one last example of this. My own driver, he, he's not a graduate. But he talks to me on policies, programs, like he's, like he's a TV anchor. And I like it. I like it. He told me, your Nyai sounds good. Where are you going to get the money from? I mean, he was raising questions. Youthful blood, I totally agree with you. You know, when you look at politicians, you know, who are, everyone is above 70, 75, 65. I don't think age has got nothing to do with politics because people get better with age. So politics is like wine. The older you get, the better you get. So I don't have anything against people who are old in politics. Let's not hold age against people. But I do feel that political parties need young people. I think if we are able to attract people in policy making, 
in politics, trust me, it will become a remarkably different area. But Congress and BJP, at least I can speak for both these parties, are working very hard to draw fresh talent. And I'm going to tell all young people, if you know, tell them to get into politics. It's not as bad as it made out to be. Shashi Tharoor and people like us have survived. Trust me, we can all make it. We're nearly out of time, so let me just ask you the last question. Uh, if Congress had won, would the high command still be called undemocratic? Given that you call them uh, well-intentioned, as in, is the Congress undemocratic per se? BJP is so as well, but they're in power and they're powerful. Yeah, Mr. Mukherjee, very valid question there, because let me tell you that in, in the Congress party, we haven't had an election since the last 20 odd years for the post of the Congress president. Congress Working Committee are nominated members. And the Congress's internal constitution says you must have them as transparent elections. AICC session is meant to be held every year. We have had two in the last six years. Which clearly, we are not practicing democracy the way we should. Therefore, I'm just going to answer your question in short. If the Congress party goes back to being a Gandhian, Nehruvian party in its true essence, lives those values, while being modern in terms of using technology, apps, you know, finding ways to reach to people, being accessible. You know, they are not too, they are not decoupled. You can have great old values which are pristine and best for the country with a modern way of making them, uh, you know, get an outreach to the common man. If the Congress party does it, we still have a story. But right now I agree, even if the Congress wins 2024, people like us will be rebels who will fight to make the party a lot more translucent and open. Thank you so much. Uh, it's been a really rewarding hour uh, for giving us your time. May I call upon my colleague on the library committee, Professor Choitali Mitro, to deliver the official vote of thanks. Thank you. Hello. Yes. Good evening, everybody. On behalf of the library subcommittee of the Bengal Club, it's my privilege to thank Sri Sanjay Jha for this cutting edge, bold talk. Thank you, sir, for giving us an hour of thoughtful time, asking questions, answering questions, and at the same time, ending with your optimism. I thank the participants and also the others who have been involved in making this digital platform a big success today. Thank you, goodbye, and good night. God bless and all of you. Thank you very much for inviting me. Have a fantastic year ahead. And I look forward to chatting with you soon again. Thank you, Mr. Mukherjee. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Chaitanya. Thank you. 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 Thank you.